Welcome to the Remedies video lecture series. This is lecture number seven. This lecture will discuss preventive injunctions. Let's begin. Preventive injunctions are issued by courts of equity. This is what's known as equitable relief. And therefore they have some distinct characteristics that are different than actions that are brought in courts of law where money damages are involved. They are designed, equitable relief is designed to prevent or compel future conduct, not to remedy past conduct. Equitable relief lies within the sound discretion of the court. That is, the court has a great deal of latitude in deciding what kind of relief to formulate. Finally, the court can fashion relief with a great deal of discretion. It does not have to do what either of the parties request. You'll see this in a number of the cases in your readings. Pay attention to what the court does in a number of those cases. It is quite apparent that they are formulating relief that is different than what either party specifically requested. Um, because these are in courts of equity, um, in addition to prevailing on the merits, there are a number of requirements that a plaintiff must meet in order to obtain equitable relief and that the court will use to evaluate whether to grant or deny uh, the injunction. Uh, the first of these is that there not be an adequate remedy at law. Um, the second is that the plaintiff must show irreparable harm. Third, the court will engage in a balancing of the interests, that is the hardships involved and the rights of each of the parties involved. It will look at uh, the pros and cons of awarding relief on either side of the cause of action. Finally, again because this is a court of equity, it will take into consideration the public interest that are involved if it grants the injunction and Likewise, if it denies the injunction. Let's take a look at each of these. As to the inadequate remedy at law in irreparable harm, we're going to look at those together because in many respects they are tied together. Now when we look at inadequacy of the remedy, uh, we're really looking to see if there are other modes of relief, regardless of the seriousness of the harm, that will make the plaintiff essentially whole that will meet the, either the plaintiff's expectancy interest or give the plaintiff something um, that they are seeking uh, that can be handled at law. And you see this going on in the Thurston Enterprises case where the trucks driven through the drive-in. Uh, the court in that instance denies equitable relief uh, to both of the parties and it does so because what the plaintiff was seeking there was essentially backward looking. It was seeking to have its drive-in repaired and through damage that occurred in the past and therefore the court determined that money damages would compensate uh, the plaintiff in that case and because money damages would compensate there was an adequate remedy at law and therefore no reason to um, entertain and to um, come to an injunction. The second part of this uh, two-prong discussion is whether there is irreparable harm. And this involves the quality and severity of the harm. The plaintiff must show that they will suffer irreparable harm if the injunction is not issued. But as you will see in the cases, the the suffering of irreparable harm is clearly tied to the adequacy of the remedy at law. If money damages will sufficiently compensate the plaintiff, most courts, if not all, will find that there is no irreparable harm because when the money damages are paid, the plaintiff is made whole. So irreparable harm is invariably tied to inadequate remedy at law. If money damages are not sufficient, uh, then there is no adequate remedy at law and in many instances courts will find that the plaintiff has been irreparably harmed. But these two must be shown by the plaintiff. They must go through each of these hoops. They must show that 
there is no adequate remedy at law, essentially that the, what they're seeking is cannot be exchanged for money and that they are going to be significantly harmed if the injunction is not granted. Um, and as a result, we find that there is no irreparable harm and the court should entertain the injunction. Um, finally, there are some things that traditionally implicate equity. There are some types of um, issues involved in cases that seem to come up. The first is real property. Um, as we've seen before, courts are want to hold that real property is unique. And as a result, paying one for their real property will not be deemed to be an adequate remedy at law. Likewise, a continual trespass or nuisance uh, also seem to implicate um, equity and the courts will entertain these causes of action because in order to compensate a plaintiff in a continuing trespass the plaintiff would need to bring their case over and over and over again for each of the trespasses in order to be compensated and yet it still may not prevent the defendant from engaging in the trespass or continuing with the nuisance. Likewise, in the interference with the rights of another, you know, and in all other cases where money damages will not adequately compensate the plaintiff. Now again, there's a number of questions to ask when looking at these two, the inadequate remedy at law and the irreparable harm. What is it that the plaintiff is seeking is really the first question that a court should ask. What is it exactly that the plaintiff wants? And if what they want is can be translated into money and if what they want is backward looking then there is an adequate remedy at law and the court will deny the injunction again whether it's backward or forward looking and uh, the nature of the harm they're seeking to remedy what is it again that they're seeking redress for so this is what a court will look to in deciding how to handle a case like this and again, now, because this is an equitable uh, action, uh, the courts have discretion to consider multiple interests. That is, they will look at the interest of the plaintiff, but they will also look at the interest of the defendant and balance those against each other in deciding whether to grant or deny the injunction. So even if there is no adequate remedy at law, and there is irreparable harm that the plaintiff is going to suffer, the court will still engage in this balancing of interest in deciding whether to grant the injunction. And you see this playing out. You see this balancing of interest, uh, the hardships involved, the rights of each party. You see it playing out in Boomer versus Atlantic Cement. There the court balances the harm to the plaintiffs, the pollution that is harming them on a daily basis, uh, against the investment of the defendant in the plant. The court even goes on to mention that the uh, defendants uh, invested $45 million in building this plant, that it's a viable business, uh, that if they uh, require the uh, defendants to abate their nuisance, that it may require them to shut down their plant and that will cost the community serious harm in the loss of jobs and in the loss of revenue. So in that court, in that case, the court is struggling to balance the interest of the plaintiffs who are suffering from pollution against the interest of the cement company and the community. Um, and they'll also use this balancing in formulating the order. And you see this as well in this Triplet versus uh, Buchman case, which is the case with the island on the lake. They formulate an order uh, that gives both parties something. And as the court says there, they can balance the hardships involved and grant relief upon whatever terms it deems equitable. So there they're looking at what they can do to meet the needs of both parties in coming to relief and therefore they may not order uh, relief that is all that one party is asking for or against uh, what the other party is opposing. They will also consider the enforceability 
of crafting the order. Uh, and they, they will determine whether in deciding whether to grant relief, whether the order can be made enforceable. Because if it can't be enforced, then the court is going to find itself mired in litigation uh, time and time again. And you see this playing out in Galea uh, versus Onassis. That is the case where the paparazzi was continually harassing uh, Jackie Onassis and her children, taking pictures at all times of day and night, popping up. Uh, coming close to physically assaulting them. In that case, the court indicated the restraint must be clear, simple, and effective so that Galea, uh, substantial, Galea's substantial compliance cannot seriously be disputed unless a violation occurs because the court did not want to find itself uh, continually litigating whether he was in violation of the order, he was too close, he was too far, he was doing what the court was requiring, he wasn't doing what the court was requiring. So this is an issue that the courts will consider in these types of cases. Again, because this is a court of equity, the court will look at the public interest in deciding whether to grant the injunction and the relief uh, to be ordered. Um, and not unlike other cases that we've seen, the public interest in some of these can weigh heavily. And you see this in this Graham versus Sirocco case. This is a private action uh, to enforce a covenant not to compete. And yet the court spends time talking about the public's need for medical care and takes that into consideration in limiting uh, the order that it comes up with in limiting uh, the non-compete going on in that case. You see it as well in Boomer where the public interest in maintaining jobs is discussed, the public interest in maintaining revenue from the cement plant. So in these cases and in all permanent injunction cases there sometimes is a public interest piece that gets advocated and if you were the lawyer, for example, the defendant in Graham versus Sirocco, you would be seeking to use this public interest to blunt the non-compete, to say that Graham uh, should not be awarded all that he is seeking because the public will be denied medical care if your client doctor is not permitted to practice law pursuant to the non-compete. So you can see that the equitable nature of injunctions uh, dictates uh, all four of these elements. That there not be an adequate remedy at law, uh, that, there, that the plaintiff suffer irreparable harm, that the court will balance the interest of both the plaintiff and the defendant, and finally that the court will consider the public interest in deciding whether to grant the injunction. And all four of these, in addition to discussing whether the injunction should be issued on its merits, uh, must be reviewed by uh, a court and obviously must be advocated uh, pro or con by the parties in the case. Uh, this brings us to a conclusion of this short video. Again, as always, remember to go to the assessment uh, section on the TWIN page and fill out the video uh, lecture assessment for video lecture number seven. Thank you.